Welcome, everyone. Um, today, I'm really pleased to have the first interview on our Native Yoga podcast. And um, today, we're going to speak with a really good friend of mine named Greg Nardi, who I have the privilege of knowing Greg for many years now. And He's an incredible yoga teacher. Um, he's been a mentor and an inspiration over the years for me in terms of my yoga practice, for the study of philosophy and yoga, and also um, he's incredibly gifted with uh, mantra practice. And um, so I am really excited to have this chance to um give you all a listen to uh, some of Greg's ideas and and what's happening in the, the world, in the yoga world today. Um, welcome, Greg. Hey, Todd. Good to be here. Thank you, man. Um, so I'm curious, curious, what was or what is there, your earliest memory that you have of hearing the word yoga and how did that impress you? Like what was your kind of first introduction into the world of yoga? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, um, when I was a kid, uh, my grandmother uh, was taking a, a yoga class at like the local YMCA. Um, I must have been about, I don't know, eight, eight, nine years old, something around there. And uh, so sometimes she would come home and she would just kind of get us to play uh, doing different poses. And it was never like, asana names or you know i didn't even know it was necessarily yoga but she would tell us to like act like a snake you know when we would do cobra pose that's uh, cool or you know different things like that and then you know through that actually there was a, a bit of a more profound experience with it because i was asthmatic and i remember that when she was caring for me and i had an asthma attack that she actually taught me um how to do what she called yoga breathing and it was something that I actually used to help calm me down uh, when I was having an asthma attack. And, and this is all like really early impressions. So this is before I ever even entertained the idea of doing yoga. It wasn't like that was my introduction to yoga and I just did it from there. This is just a really early experience that when I did ultimately come to yoga, um, it was kind of like, oh yeah, I remember this. Like I did this you know, years ago when I was a kid. Oh, that's really cool. Um, do you, do you, uh, do you still have asthma, effects of asthma? I do. It's much better, um, than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was pretty severe. Yeah. And, uh, actually, like, I went through a period when I was first doing yoga, I was, uh, very extreme. I have one of those personalities that I, I, you know, don't do things halfway. <laughs> I really jumped right in and I was doing hours of yoga every day and, and really, really, really strict with my diet. Um, and actually for years, my asthma went away completely. Wow. Um, and then over the years, I've kind of, you know, gotten a, a little more balanced in my approach, but, but I have noticed that the asthma has come back, but it's never come back to the severity of when I was a kid. Well, that's really cool. I, I hear you. My um, my daughter has asthma, and so it's um, I I understand how how serious that can be when you can't get a deep breath. So um, yeah, I, I hear you, man. Um, what what was the first like experience that you had with a yoga teacher? With a yoga teacher, um, so that was interesting. I would say this is actually when my introduction to yoga began. Um, I had a good friend of mine um, who we had taken a dance class and we just had so much fun on this dance class, like never really took it seriously. I have to say I wasn't a very good student of dance, <laughs> um, but, but laughed my way through the whole thing. And so, you know, I guess about a year later, she was uh, wanting to take a yoga class. And so this friend, uh, her name was Christine, um, she invited me to take class. And I just thought we were going to go and have a laugh. And immediately, um, I just knew that this is something I had been really searching for for my whole life. Um, it was a very small class. In, in, uh, I was living in New Jersey, and I was in the suburbs. Um, there was, uh, this was in 1996. And 
you know, the, the room was in the front of a massage studio, and I think the, the entire room could maximum hold 10 yoga mats if it was, like, packed. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it was a real small kind of thing, and yoga was pretty underground at the time, but, you know, just straight away I knew um, that this was something that, you know, that this was going to alter the shape of my life. That's really cool. I mean, you're, you're right, 1996, there, there, there really wasn't, a lot of options to to take yoga classes. Would you agree? Definitely. I mean, I was kind of lucky in the sense, you know, New York was a, a New York City was a bit of a, a early kind of mecca for uh, for yoga practice. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like it was like New York or L.A. So I, you know, was relatively close to Manhattan, and so it was sort of trickling out into the suburbs at that time. Um, so yeah, but there wasn't as many options as there are now, for sure. Oh, that's really cool. Um, how did you, what, was there a moment or a defining moment that you knew that you wanted to teach yoga? Yeah, I have to say it was probably like a beginner's impulse, but like from the beginning, because, you know, like I was one of those that <laughs> it took me a long time to find my way. Like everybody was, you know, oh, you've got to go to school. You've got to figure out what you want to do. You've got to get a job. And I just could not settle. Like I tried so many things and, you know, nothing ever felt right. Everything seemed kind of bleak. Um, and, you know, because I always had this uh, spiritual side, this spiritual leaning. Um, and that always felt like the most important thing in the world and all the sort of mundane um you know, working and making money. And that, that always kind of seemed like a secondary thing. I, I was raised that, you know, you, you work hard so that you can enjoy later. And I always felt like if I'm going to spend the majority of my time doing something that I want it to have more meaning than that. So when I found yoga within the first three months, the teacher, uh, because I was, again, I didn't jump in, you know, I didn't dip my toe in, I jumped in. So I was taking about six yoga classes a day. Oh, wow. Um, every every class that the studio offered. And so the teacher <laughs> just sort of looked at me at some point and he's like, do you want to teach? <laughs> yeah, right. You seem to really like it. You love hanging out in here. <laughs> yeah. I, I need so a little I bit of a break. Can, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think that was it. I think he, he was, um, you know, he was not much older than I was. I was 22 when I started. I think he was 27. And, uh, and I think that, you know, yoga was really starting to take off at that time. It was the beginning of the boom. So he was really just starting to get overwhelmed with how busy he was and was looking for somebody that he could share it with. So I, be I was with, I was in an apprenticeship within the first three months of my practice. Um, and it really wasn't until I went to India, probably three years later that I got a scope of like what you know, like, like maybe that, that you shouldn't jump right into teaching that, uh -huh. that is, there's, there's a, matru a maturity that is necessary in your practice, uh, before you really can hold space for others. So, That's a good point. Who, who was that, yeah. that you were practicing with? At the early days, my first teacher. Yeah. Yeah. It was a guy named Sahil, um, Desuk. he, he was, uh, you know, I, I don't even know that he teaches yoga anymore. I think he's moved out to California um, and I think he teaches like Tantra yoga classes or something like that. And the massage school is still there it was the New Jersey school of massage. Um, the owner and main teacher there was Larry Heisler. And that was actually a super cool place because they taught massage, they taught yoga, but Larry was really like this guru type character in the sense that he had worked with a woman called Hilda Charlton, who had been a disciple of. Sai Baba, who's an Indian guru. And so the whole place was, you know, about healing, but it was almost like a front for this spiritual community. Um, and, you know, there was good and, and bad in that, just like in any mm. community. Um, but I think those early, early days before I found Ashtanga Yoga had really kind of impressed upon me um, you know, the scope of yoga is much more than a physical practice. As a matter of fact, the physical practice was not necessarily the thing that attracted me the most. Right. That's cool. Uh, when, when was your first Ashtanga practice or your first Ashtanga class? Let's see. That was, I think, in 1998. Uh -huh. um, so I was 
getting so excited about yoga. Um, and as I said, I was like pretty close to Manhattan. So I had the ability to go in and try a lot of different styles of yoga. And I did like any kind of workshop that I could. Um, and I think I found Jeeva Mukti. As a matter of fact, I, I, one of the things I did is I just went into Manhattan. I would stop people on the street and say, hey, you know, where's the coolest place to practice yoga right now? <laughs> and uh, so I got kind of directed to Jiva Mukti um, oh, that's cool. back when they were on Second Avenue in the East Village. Yeah, it was awesome. Nice. And that was the first time I had experienced like a vinyasa class where I was hands-on assisted. As a matter of fact, Sharon Gannon was teaching a class and she gave me like the squish and Tashimasanasana. And it just like, I, it just blew me away. Like I remember floating out of that class. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, I've got to figure this out. And I, I, at that time, they were more closely aligned with their roots in Ashtanga yoga. Uh -huh. So I kind of just sought out an Ashtanga teacher. And I was very, very lucky that a guy named Raji Krohn, who was, uh, he was a student of Richard Freeman's and he had taught at Yoga Works and he had just moved into uh, Montclair, New Jersey, which was only a couple of towns over from me. And he started a full on Ashtanga program. So I was able to work with him and he was actually the one that directed me to go to Mysore for the first time. So I, it was just all very serendipitous. I was like, just really lucky, uh, just so passionate. And so I just got led to the next step and the next step and the next step. That's awesome. And I mean, for uh, just so all our listeners are aware, you have taken quite a few trips to India over the years, probably to, to name a certain number. <laughs> I, I'm sure you probably have stopped counting, but um, I know a lot of people, uh, I have had the chance to go to India as well, and it's a pretty fascinating country. What What's something that you love about India? <laughs> like without even thinking much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The word that comes up is the chaos. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, and I think that's one of those things that people really react to and they either love it or they hate it. Um, and, of course, once you really get to know it, like anything else, there's a pattern within it. It, yeah. it seems like chaos when you're not from it, but there is a, an order within that chaos once you learn how to see it. Um, but I just love that feeling of just, uh, you know, there is a feeling of, freedom um and, and i and i recognize that that freedom also arises because i'm not from there yeah uh, so when i go i'm going as an outsider and so i'm sort of free from my own culture but not quite part of the culture that i'm visiting and so there's a certain freedom of being in that in-between place that's a really good point i think you're right greg there's something about international travel where you do feel this incredible sense of freedom and it's like, why do I, why do I feel so alive right now? What's, but you're right. I think you're hit the nail on the head with that in between place that it puts you in. That's really cool. Yeah. What, what I, and I know that you're uh, obviously a, a big time or avid Ashtanga practitioner, but what other styles of yoga have come into influence with you for you? Yeah, you know, I mean, I've, I have largely kind of restricted myself to Ashtanga yoga. It doesn't mean that I haven't done other styles or experimented a bit, but, but I have to say in the beginning, I was very experimental with choosing a style. Mm. Um, but like, it was sort of like dating. And then once you get married, you're, you're married, you know, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it kind of, you know, it became my, my thing. Now, of course, Due to circumstance, you take other classes or, you know, try other things. Um, so I would say the main influences, my, my first two years, there was a lot of uh, PCM, a lot of traditional Chinese medicine. The mm. massage place that I was in was um, taught shiatsu massage. Uh -huh. And they were big proponents of macrobiotic eating. So a lot of Chinese influence. Um, and so with the way that we looked at Yoga was not through the um, the Nadi system, but more through the meridian system from Chinese medicine, um, oh, that's and cool. that's always kind of stayed with me. Uh, so, and that there is a style called Acu Yoga that is um, developed around that same principle. Nice. And I, then I would say that. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, keep going. 
then then I would say that the other, and I think this is a pretty common common experience, um, but I, I worked at a, a studio where I ran on a Shanga program for several years in New Jersey. And the owner of that studio was a very well-regarded and experienced uh, Iyengar teacher. And so I did training with her in both restorative and, um, and Iyengar yoga. And so that kind of ability to look at the body and look at alignment also uh, influenced me quite strongly. Nice. And then I would say I was a, a shiatsu massage practitioner for years as well. And so the ability to kind of feel and palpate and, and work with touch, um, I think we're all big influences. That's cool. There's a, there's a little bit of a light bulb that goes off when you're in the yoga world and then you're in the massage world. And then you see that there's, um, you know, the ability to actually do assisting work with either pressure point work or just hands-on assisting during a yoga practice that it seems like there's a full circle element that it all kind of comes together. That's really cool that you, you've had that background and all those different modalities and techniques. It's fascinating because, you know, I think this whole thing about touch has been coming up and I don't even mean like currently because of physical distancing, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, which, which also is, is going to influence this, our field. I think, yeah. but, but you know, before that there was, sort of the ethics of touch was becoming a real big conversation. And I think that, you know, I think that's a really important conversation, like extremely important conversation. But I also think that we need to educate ourselves better about the importance of touch and the skillful use of touch. Mm. Um, because touch is not just about manipulating somebody's body into a shape. You know, as you know, as a body worker, like, you know, touch can be healing on, on so many levels, um, as long as it's done in a way that is ethical and boundaried, of course. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated. It's one of the things that I've always really loved about Ashtanga Yoga is, of course, that we teach it, you know, through, through so many different faculties, you know, verbalizing it, demonstrating it, using touch, you know, and all these different things. And so it becomes this, like, you know, real holistic experience um, as we're learning and practicing and teaching. Gosh, that's a great point too, Greg. I mean, I this is definitely a subject that I was wanting to bring us toward because um, obviously everyone who's listening to this over the next couple of weeks is going to be completely aware and familiar of what's happening with the uh, coronavirus. And um, it obviously this also creates the potential for a bit of a time capsule. So, I mean, I wonder someone who's born today that would potentially listen to this conversation 20 years from now, um, you know, the same way our grandparents talk about World War II or um, uh, a significant event that happened in the past and we don't really have the ability to connect with it really easily except for, you know, history study and, and hearing stories from our relatives. But um, we've gone through a pretty radical shift in the last couple of weeks in regards to what you're talking about. Like there was, we were having really profound and interesting discussions, in my opinion, about the role that touch plays in in the yoga room and with students and being um, responsible and um, figuring out ways to have that communication process kept open so that the students feel comfortable and that they have the ability to uh, express their feelings. Um, and, and also, so there's that whole world. And then with this element of like social distancing and stay six feet apart from everybody and wondering, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, even today there was an article that I saw you, um, mention about that, you know, they're saying that maybe for 18 months longer, we might still want to stay away from people, eliminate the handshake and all these different things. Um, what, <laughs> what are you thinking right now and feeling with, with all of this going on? I, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't sort of wish what we're going through on anything, uh, on anyone. Um, we're all going through it together. Uh, it's difficult, you know, and, and I think you're right. We will never really be able to explain how this feels to future generations, um, but this is definitely going to be in the history books. Um, 
But, you know, as a, as a yoga practitioner, I think it's important to try to reflect on, you know, what, what can we gain from this moment? Mm. Um, you know, acknowledge the difficulty, but also see if there's anything in it for us. And I think there is some important lessons here. Um, you know, in terms of the touch conversation, we'll kind of, because there's so many, we could take this conversation in so many ways, but <laughs> yeah. in terms of the touch conversation, <laughs> I, you know, I think one of the things that, for instance, I know a lot of times people think that the role of the teacher is to administer touch or to give adjustments give adjustments and give out poses, you know, and I think that this is really going to help us to question that role um, because I've always thought of touch is, again, it's one of many tools that a teacher has. Mm. Number two, you know, that touch is not just about using force to help somebody make a shape um, so mm. much as it is the ability to guide somebody's awareness. Um, which is also about power and consent. Um, and so I think we're going to have this wonderful opportunity to really examine what are our expectations of teaching and what are our, what are the um, ways that we can utilize the shala space, the, the classroom space, um, to help practitioners um, you know, sort of, sort of move forward in their practice. And, you know, and again, this, this whole idea, I mean, this can go even deeper into like, what are people's aspirations for practice? Is it mm. just about making shape? You right. know what I mean? And so, right. so, so for me, like what I'm seeing, and this is interesting, we've all been in a rush to, to get online and start teaching online. Yeah. And at first I was like, really like hesitant about it. <laughs> Cause I was like, it's just never going to work. You know what I mean? Cause I know. But, so actually, like, I'm, I'm super impressed um, because what's happening is, is as we're limited in our touch, I, I think it's just like when you take one sense away, all the other senses get heightened. Oh, yeah. You know, as we're taking away touch, like all these other kind of things are starting to come up in people's practices. And, and I'm starting to notice that, that actually people ha are having like a deepening of their experience. Mm. It's not necessarily a lesser experience, yeah. you know, um, that's because really maybe cool. Maybe they're realizing that their practice is more about like listening to their body rather than performing asana. That's a great way to look at it. I like that you are are pointing out the the online component because it's a. Uh, I think a lot of us that uh, are I, I've never taught online or virtually ever before, and it was something that I had thought about and watched other people do. And I thought, gosh, that seems really smart. That seems like a great idea. You know, you could have the ability to work with people anywhere in the world, but I've having, um, been teaching in a, in a room, uh, with a group of people, it just, I, I've always felt so kind of in the moment people person kind of situation that it just never seemed like an option. And then when we were told to shut down and, you know, you go through that whole element of like, how am I going to do what I do? Um, I, I feel the I feel similar, Greg. It's been an incredible learning experience to um, to to try to interact, and I'm finding it's amazing that you, you can actually get the job done. Like it, it's yeah. it's it's possible to do still a pretty good job of instructing. It almost feels exactly the same. But just the physicality, the 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 approximation to the people is what feels different. Like uh, like the not having that interaction process, potentially even a handshake or being able to see them and make eye contact. Um, you know, and then obviously to be able to see people in person is totally different than when you're just talking into a camera and can't see them. But um, it is an interesting experience, I have to say. And I, I definitely appreciate the fact that you're pointing out some of the more positive aspects of it. Yeah, I, I think my big hesitation was always the fear of losing the relational aspect. Because yeah. to me, that is such an important part of teaching. I'm not one who really likes to just like broadcast my thoughts. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, because I feel like there's a responsibility. Like, we can never control how 
our thoughts and our words lands for people. Um, they're always going to do with them what they want. But I think there is a certain responsibility to kind of be present as people are kind of processing, you know, and, and that, that teaching be a little bit of a like give and take, a back and forth. Yeah. And I was really afraid of going online and kind of losing that. And, yeah. you know, I know everybody's doing it a little differently, but like we're kind of doing it um, where, you know, we're like actually everybody's in their boxes. We're not using Zoom, but it's a very similar um, yeah. platform. Everybody's <laughs> in their boxes. We're watching them. And I'm kind of queuing. Uh, Amanda and I both are, are queuing, you know, based on what we're seeing people do in the boxes. And the first time I gave a queue <laughs> and I saw somebody change their asana in reflecting the cue that I had just given, I was like, oh, this is this is working. The relationship is still yeah, there, you know, yep. and that was like an amazing moment. It was like a light bulb moment for me. Yeah, that's really cool. W wouldn't you agree that coming from, or would you agree that coming from that, well, I say old school, but maybe we're, I'm just only really going back to like say maybe we're just old <laughs> yeah to like 12 years ago <laughs> 12 or 15 years ago and you're in India and you're hanging out in Mysore and you're you know maybe getting on a little moped or something and cruising around the streets of Mysore super early in the morning and you're dodging some cows and you're you know you're you, you, you get to the shala and you you go for practice and if someone at that point had said to you you know you're going to be teaching through the computer you know, would would you would you would you have believed them? <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, I remember right? like struggling with Facebook when it first. Came out. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I had that when I was when I was like twenty or so. I, I remember like swearing to myself I would never own a computer. Like uh -huh. I I had yeah. this thing of like I thought if I had a computer that would mean the ultimate sellout to the human soul. That yeah. So it's. You know, that's kind yeah, of great. I have that ludite tendency as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it took me forever to get a cell phone. It took me forever to get a computer. But I, I have to say, like, once I jumped in, I jumped in. Just like I right. like my tendency is, you know. So then I had, like, a smartphone and a laptop and everything. And, you know, it became an integral part of my work. But I, I've still resisted this idea, you know. Like, I, I don't love social media. You know, you don't see me all over social media. I don't love um you know a lot of self-promotion through that way probably to my own detriment um and you know and i i've really resisted like the movement over the last years towards streaming video you know instructional videos on youtube and and i get it i've heard all the reasons why it's a good thing and i'm yeah. happy for all those people who are doing it and all those people are benefiting from it it's just not what i feel you know helps me it's not where I'm at my best as a teacher. Yeah. And, uh, and so like this has been a surprisingly enjoyable experience. Yeah. I would agree with you, Greg. I have, I'm having a similar reaction. That's really cool. You, um, you know, and that's something that's always, I think the first time I had the chance to practice with you and, um, that impressed me so much. What was your connection to the yoga practice through, the various um, methods, be it mantra practice and your incredible dedication and determination and passion for learning the Sanskrit language and <clears throat> your incredible dedication and consistency with studying uh, the study of yoga philosophy. And so I feel like that, that was a, that's always been a huge inspiration for me and so then I guess I'm, I'm curious because there's this vast array in each of those departments being the asana world, the chanting world, the philosophical world. Um, how do you blend that into your daily routine? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, number one, um, you know, I, I'm not really like an expert in any of those things. Like I'm not an endologist, you know, I'm not an academic or a philosopher I'm not a Sanskritist. I don't know the language, um, but I have kind of always followed my my curiosity and my passion. Um, mm. And I always felt like when when I first started doing yoga, I knew immediately that it fulfilled a lot of different. It, it ticked a lot of boxes for me. It fulfilled me in a lot of different ways. 
but there were so many techniques and it was almost like you know like like a, a a toy chest that when you open the lid the toys are just like all like piled in there and there's no <laughs> order to it at all and yeah. like you know so there's like so many cool things to play with but i had no idea how any of it worked that's a good why... vi- that's a good visual i like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah like like why was this important why was that important you know i knew that there was like something about healthcare something about spirituality you know something about mental peace you know but i didn't really get it all so i've just been following my curiosity and my passion and it's led me in a lot of different directions um sanskrit pronunciation and and mantra and and philosophy and all sorts of things uh so the way that that worked for me um you know i've begun to understand yoga as much more than any one practice um, each practice, whether it be asana or breath work or, or mantra work or even like uh, philosophy, the sadhyaya, the study, um, you know, each one of those kind of is like um, a medicine, you know. And so uh, what I have to do is if I'm if my goal with my yoga practice and I'm not saying this is everybody's aspiration, but mine is to be. Um, have a sense of harmony in my life to try to operate from a place of peace Um, then what I am tasked with is to discern on any given day uh, ways in which I might be out of harmony Mm. uh, or ways in which I might be off balance Mm. and so over years I've become very familiar with these techniques you know just like an herbalist who has a, a medicine kit and so I can choose which technique is going to be appropriate on a given day. Mm. I can choose the amount of each technique that I feel is necessary to bring me back into a state of harmony. Nice. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it takes time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. you have to you know, do a course of, of techniques. But, but I generally find that that's how I use my yoga now so i might on a given day do you know a heavy asana practice and that's it on other days i might do more breathing and chanting um what i try to do the main thing is that every day i try and spend some time where i'm focused on my own uh state state Mm. of state of health and 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 well-being and you know, so whatever that might look like on any given day, um, and then just skillfully kind of applying whatever seems appropriate. That's really cool, Greg, because I, I, um, I've had, uh, experience before where sometimes I've, as I've been trying to follow your lead in that respect of (laughs) doing (laughs) philosophy study and do your practice and, and, uh, where I've felt almost like it's, it's, um, like overwhelming (laughs) and the way that you, explained it there where you are able to then feel like if you just take a portion of each and, and apply a little bit each day, that's really cool. That that makes a lot of sense. That does sound like a mature approach. Yeah. I, I think, you know, what I realize is like we, we have to budget our time. Um, and so what I look for are like, you know, what are the things that I have to do? Mm. What are the things that I do that aren't serving me and then what are the things that I like to do and what are the things that I could do that would serve me but that I'm not doing right Mm -hmm. so there's like kind of all four ways that I could budget my time and and then I just try and put a little bit more into the column of like you know things that will serve me a little bit less in the column of things that won't serve me you know uh, but but of course there's the first thing is like what is our duty what are the things we have to do um you know and structuring our lives so that the things that we have to do aren't overwhelming us and then leaving enough left over so that we can also do the things that serve us yeah and, and ideally if you can find things that you have to do that serve you that's like you know that's great too <laughs> that's the best right <laughs> yeah in um in this uh, current climate, um, I think all yoga teachers and well, basically everybody in the world is affected right now. Um, but speaking from the perspective of um, your your profession is as a as a teacher, 
Um, how has this transition affected you um, personally and or impacted your teaching career, so to speak? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think like everybody, it's been very stressful. Um, I've been uh, lucky to sort of, you know, I, I, I'm very blessed with a good support network. Mm. Um, so I've had just, you know, great friends that I've been doing check-ins with every day who I can be really honest and, and vulnerable with. Um, and that's been incredibly, um, it's, it's really been life-saving during this time. Um, you know, some of the major challenges that, you know, I've, I've been kind of reflecting a lot on my life choices. We mentioned all those trips to Mysore. Mm. Um, you know, one of, one of the things, and then uh, another thing that I went through was like a long process where you know I made a choice for love um, to go through the process of immigrating to Canada and then immigrating back to the USA um, and both of those choices you know really didn't allow me the opportunity to kind of build a lot of security uh -huh. um, you know I've had a wealth of experience but um, you know I have really been for, for different reasons, for different life choices, um, moving around a lot, taking large periods of time where I'm not employed or not working every year. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, that's that been, you know, like in some ways it's been a real blessing, but in other ways it's been a real sacrifice. And so here getting into a position now where, you know, teaching was just completely shut down yeah, um, was absolutely anxiety provoking yeah. <laughs> to say the least i would have to agree um, <laughs> yeah. yeah sure yeah yeah, yeah. and again that's where turning to my support networks you know you are a part of that network as as you know we're, we're in a lot of groups together and we're in a lot of communication and mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's just it was so helpful and then you know my uh, my teaching partner amanda she she kept saying in the beginning, like, have faith. And I was like, oh, that sounds so lame right now. Like, yeah. you know, we, we get all this like yoga talk, like, oh, everything happens for a reason. And, look, you know, and I was just like, this is not what I want to hear right now. This is like, sounds like a lot of privileged BS. Right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but, but then like we did this whole online thing and like our community that we've, you know, been, you know, nurturing and, and been, been a part of for years has actually come has shown up for us and, you know, has supported us um, financially through these online classes. And, you know, and it's a very, it feels very reciprocal. And, um, and so like that idea of having faith um, really hit home when I realized it, you know, it is, it's having faith because we've sown the seeds. We've, we've, we have done a lot of work, um, you know, and, and maybe it's not, you know, maybe in my case, it hasn't been, you know, in terms of like savings and financial security, but it has been investing in relationships, investing in yeah. community, investing in yeah. experience. And, and that has really gotten me through. Um, and so it, it was like a really great reminder, you know, I was gripped with this anxiety, like I've lived this kind of alternative life. And have I made a huge mistake at 46 years old? And, right. and then all of a sudden, I was like, well, you know, actually, like, I, this abundance is here and, and it, it, it almost was like a real affirmation that I've gone my own way through life. I've always followed my heart and my passion and my interest and that it has supported me. It has benefited me and it has borne fruit. So that was a really beautiful thing to see. That's really positive, Greg. I appreciate hearing, um, your honesty about how challenging it is, but, but also that there's, um, definitely that, that potential for some, uh, some good things that come out of this without a doubt. I, I, um, I agree with you that I think the, the, the unsettling nature of it, obviously there, like, you know, sometimes I'll think there's gotta be some people out there that just feel completely untouched by this. Like they might have enough, um, backup income to just kind of sit back and go, you know, this is, I'll just ride this out. This is no problem. And, um, but then if we analyze it a little further, there's the possibility and prob 
probably probability that everybody is getting shaken to the core a bit here right now. Um, so I'm also a believer that out coming out of those um, really challenging core shaking experiences, um, some we end up getting more stronger, uh, more careful about or or um, appreciative. I should say I was what I was meaning to say about what we have in our life, and so that's really cool. I, I think you're right too that the the value of relationships and community and um, having those connections is probably what's of most value right now. Yeah, it, it's, it's really been wonderful, you know, and, and again, I, I get it. This is not going to affect everybody the same, you know, just like mm -hmm. you said, some people will weather it more than others. Some people are weathering it better than others, you know, not mm -hmm. just because some people are, you know, you know, there are those who are sick, um, but there are those who, you know, didn't even have, the the money to, to purchase food while we're in quarantine and you know what I mean like there's, right. there's a lot of suffering beyond just the, the numbers that we're seeing on the newscast and you know and I know that when we go back to whatever the new normal is going to be that the recovery is also not going to be even and so you know I just want to kind of hold space for that I want to count my blessings you know, be grateful. And also, I, I hope, and I think this is the real opportunity is that after we've kind of all been forced into this moment of pause, is that like, we can maybe take this, this opportunity that as we go back, that that we can take the opportunity to lift each other up. Um, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody is going to do that. But I think that as you know, people who have committed ourselves to a lifestyle that's about being aware and, and, uh, you know, compassionate and these types of things that we can maybe look for opportunities where we can support each other as we get back to, you know, whatever our new normal is going to be. I agree, Greg, the new normal. <laughs> what is that going to be? I hear you. Um, Greg, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, study with you, practice with you, what are the um, what are the best ways to do that? Either via website or or um, how could we get a hold of you? Sure, I you know I've got a couple of different things going, um, but my main website is www.ashtangayogaworldwide.com. Um, and there's a newsletter on there if you want to stay in touch. And then uh, for a lot of the work, the local work I've mentioned, uh, I teach with Amanda Palermo. Um, and we teach under the name Grassroots Yoga Florida. So that is www.grassrootsyogafl.com. Um, and so that also will keep you up to date on some of the courses and, and local uh teachings that we've been doing and that's actually where our our virtual shala is being housed nice um is through grassroots yoga awesome i highly recommend everybody to check greg and amanda out and and um get in contact and get on greg's newsletter because um yeah, there, you have a wealth of knowledge and information and inspiration greg and i'm so thankful for you taking the time to speak with us um, before we close, do you have uh, a message or I feel like you've actually given, given quite a few different positive messages today, but, uh, to close with, do you have a message that you'd like to leave the listener with today? Um, and number one, I just want to say thank you very much, Todd, for kind of hosting this and, um, you know, for, for all you do for your community and, and for the yoga community in general. Um, and I, I guess if I had one thing um, to say is, you know, just to really, you know, take care of yourself. Um, these are exceptional times. And, you know, oftentimes things get under our skin and we don't even realize it. And so just, you know, taking that opportunity to do that little check in with yourself every day you know, see where you're at, um, take a few moments to kind of practice some peace and compassion for yourself first, um, you know, and, and God bless everyone, man. I hope, I hope we all uh, stay connected through this. Thank you, Greg, so much, man. I really appreciate you taking the time today with us, and hopefully we'll be able to do it again in the future. 
Sounds awesome. All right, man. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye, Sean. All right. Take care, man. Have a good one. <laughs>